Chapter 6 The spring, without a leaf to toss, bare and bright like a virgin fierce in her chastity, scornful in her purity, was laid out on fields wide-eyed and watchful, and entirely careless of what was done or thought by the beholders. Prue Ramsey, leaning on her father's arm, was given in marriage. What, people said, could have been more fitting? And, they added, how beautiful she looked. As summer neared, as the evenings lengthened, there came to the wakeful, the hopeful, walking the beach, stirring the pool, imaginations of the strangest kind, of flesh turned to atoms which drove before the wind, of stars flashing in their hearts, of cliff, sea, cloud and sky, brought purposely together to assemble outwardly the scattered parts of the vision within. In those mirrors, the minds of men, in those pools of uneasy water, in which clouds forever turn and shadows form, dreams persisted, and it was impossible to resist the strange intimation which every gull, flower, tree, man and woman, and the white earth itself seemed to declare, but if questioned at once to withdraw, that good triumphs, happiness prevails, order rules, or to resist the extraordinary stimulus to range hither and thither in search of some absolute good, some crystal of intensity, remote from the known pleasures and familiar virtues, something alien to the processes of domestic life, single, hard, bright, like a diamond in the sand, which would render the possessor secure. Moreover, softened and acquiescent, the spring with her bees humming and gnats dancing, threw her cloak about her, veiled her eyes, averted her head, and among passing shadows and flights of small rain, seemed to have taken upon her a knowledge of the sorrows of mankind. Prue Ramsay died that summer, in some illness connected with childbirth, which was indeed a tragedy, people said. Everything, they said, had promised so well. And now, in the heat of summer, the wind sent its spies about the house again. Flies wove a web in the sunny rooms. Weeds that had grown close to the glass in the night tapped methodically at the window pane. When darkness fell, the stroke of the lighthouse which had laid itself with such authority upon the carpet in the darkness, tracing its pattern, came now in the softer light of spring, mixed with moonlight gliding gently, as if it laid its caress and lingered stealthily, and looked and came lovingly again. But in the very lull of this loving caress, as the long stroke leant upon the bed, the rock was rent asunder, another fold of the shawl loosened, there it hung and swayed. Through the short summer nights and the long summer days, when the empty rooms seemed to murmur with the echoes of the fields and the hum of flies, the long streamer waved gently, swayed aimlessly, while the sun so striped and barred the rooms and filled them with yellow haze that Mrs. McNabb, when she broke in and lurched about, dusting, sweeping, looked like a tropical fish oaring its way through sun-lanced waters. But slumber and sleep though it might, there came later in the summer ominous sounds like the measured blows of hammers dulled on felt, which, with their repeated shocks, still further loosened the shawl and cracked the teacups. Now and again some glass tinkled in the cupboard, as if a giant voice had shrieked so loud in its agony that tumblers stood inside a cupboard vibrated too. Then again silence fell, and then night after night, and sometimes in plain midday when the roses were bright and light turned on the wall, its shape clearly there seemed to drop into this silence, this indifference, this integrity, the thud of something falling. A shell exploded. Twenty or thirty young men were blown up in France, among them Andrew Ramsay, whose death, mercifully, was instantaneous. At that season, those who had gone down to pace the beach, and ask of the sea and sky what message they reported, or what vision they affirmed, had to consider, among the usual tokens of divine bounty, the sunset on the sea, the pallor of dawn, the moon rising, 
fishing boats against the moon, and children making mud pies or pelting each other with handfuls of grass. Something out of harmony with this jocundity and this serenity. There was the silent apparition of an ashen-coloured ship, for instance, come, gone. There was a purplish stain upon the bland surface of the sea, as if something had boiled and bled invisibly beneath. This intrusion into a scene calculated to stir the most sublime reflections, and lead to the most comfortable conclusions, stayed their pacing. It was difficult blandly to overlook them, to abolish their significance in the landscape, to continue, as one walked by the sea, to marvel how beauty outside mirrored beauty within. Did nature supplement what man advanced? Did she complete what he began? With equal complacence she saw his misery, his meanness, and his torture. That dream of sharing, completing, of finding in solitude on the beach an answer, was then but a reflection in a mirror, and the mirror itself was but the surface glassiness which forms in quiescence when the nobler powers sleep beneath. Impatient, despairing yet loath to go, for beauty offers her lures, has her consolations. To pace the beach was impossible, contemplation was unendurable, the mirror was broken. Mr. Carmichael brought out a volume of poems that spring, which had an unexpected success. The war, people said, had revived their interest in poetry. End of section 10